Okay, well, <clears throat> this morning we uh, really concentrated on um, how cities approach tourism and how they indeed tourists, cities think about tourists and might encourage their residents to think about tourism and vice versa. And we also looked at the progress of British cities against a number of benchmarks. Uh, we're going to change gear a bit now, moving into the early afternoon, uh, where we're going to look at the way the people who do this traveling, the people who do this tourism, are themselves changing. Though this, it must be said, is in the context of the way in which we're all being affected by um, things digital and the way the availability of devices that allow us to simply to run our lives differently and indeed choose the things we choose differently, or indeed are at some levels overwhelmed by uh, the way the world now affects us through them. Whatever it is, they've changed us all and they've changed the way we think about things, including tourism. So we're going to start off this afternoon by hearing from Nick Hall, who is the director of the Digital Tourism Think Tank and therefore admirably well placed to help us with this. And then from Helen Thompson from BBC Mobile, who's going to tell us a bit more about the way mobile, um, well, the mobile world is affecting more generally what we do. Nick. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. I always love coming to Liverpool and what I was saying uh, just during the lunch is that for me Liverpool is a fantastic city and uh, it really is a city in every sense of the word. And I think um, it's really positive to see all of these uh, brilliant events coming here during this week and I'm, I'm very pleased myself to be part of this, uh, this great conference. So today I'm going to talk to you about the changing tourists and how that is, is impacting today and in the future city tourism uh, in general. So I'm going to start by uh, looking at the travel cycle. I've uh, rather creatively used our own logo here to illustrate that. Um, and as many of you will be familiar, there are several key stages of the travel cycle, moving from this dreaming, planning, booking, sharing, uh, and also this post-trip experience, which is not there. Uh, but basically this is changing and, and the topic of today's session is about the changing uh, behavior of tourists and over the last five years it's really changed quite dramatically because of a number of things. Um, so I've come up with a few, uh, three tips really in terms of the, the over, overall approach in which uh, things are changing and what you need to consider as a tourism business or a destination uh, in terms of the impact of new developments in technology and consumer behavior. So the first is very simple. Um, it's really important for businesses uh, to really think like a human. Now, it sounds very simplistic to put it like that, but ultimately this is one of the biggest changes which is taking place uh, in the whole travel cycle. We're moving much more towards a, a people-driven economy, customer-to-customer -customer interactions, and uh, a sort of C2C uh, travel industry is, is emerging. And it's not just happening in travel, it's also happening in other industries. And I'll look at a few examples of that soon. But this is really happening in, in several aspects. So in the early awareness stage of the travel cycle, we see a huge move towards storytelling, uh, trips from other travelers being shared, uh, and real experiences which are actually inspiring others. So the, the traditional glossy image uh, that one-way communication is no longer relevant. It's, uh, it's now much more about um, seeing what others are doing and uh, gaining inspiration from that. And when it moves towards the planning stages of a trip, I, again it's about other people. It's about uh, pulling together suggestions. We have sites like Pinterest which are really uh, becoming very, very popular and are, are, are pushing a whole trend towards this kind of pinboard approach when it comes to how information is presented on the web. So again, this is about selecting and, and allowing people to gather different experiences to make their own city trip um, a, a reality. Uh, when it comes to, to booking, I think uh, for all of the hoteliers and businesses in the room, you all know uh, the impact, uh, I might not say the importance, but certainly the impact of TripAdvisor on your business. It doesn't need to be said, good or bad. Um, but whatever, however, whatever you think of TripAdvisor, it is here and it is a reality. Um, and it is something that businesses have to really get to grips with and work with because ultimately it's um, review sites like TripAdvisor and there are many others as well. So in, in Germany that you have things like Holiday Check, which are really, really influencing 
uh, travel decisions, and they are uh, deciding on whether you book one accommodation or another, or what you do in a city. So it's not something you can ignore. And then um, when it comes to sharing experiences, uh, what, what I would just refer to very simply as moments, those amazing moments that people have when they see something or they do something, which creates a huge sense of emotion, these are really being shared in sometimes the most creative ways. And it's opportunities there uh, just in using simple things like hashtags to pull all of those great moments together. So these are all about human interactions. Um, when it comes to how, as a, as a business uh, or a city destination, you might uh, sort of accomplish your goals, um, there are some, some key trends emerging. So in that uh, early awareness stage, you have to uh, think about the immersive experience that you give your consumers, your potential customers, um, thinking about creating very engaging content and also a move towards crowdsourcing content as well. I'll, I'll go to some examples to illustrate this shortly. Um, when it comes to planning, it's really about sort of, uh, I put here, giving your visitors a digital Swiss army knife so they effectively have every tool up their sleeve so they can do the, uh, plan the trip, plan that city trip in the most efficient and useful way possible. Um, this, uh, for city tourist boards, is their, their core strength and it's what they need to, um, to really uh, continue to strengthen further. Uh, when it comes to booking, We'll look at some mobile examples, but making that as quick and pain-free as possible. This is ultimately where you lose as few visitors as possible along your uh, booking cycle. And sharing, I love this, I saw it on the BBC recently, uh, a discussion uh, between some quite high-level people talking about whether internet was actually a human right and whether it should be considered a human right. And I thought, well, I, I, jury's out when it comes to the general citizen, but I think certainly most travellers would certainly consider it a human right for them. Um, and as an attraction, a business or a city destination, you really need to understand that it's not just something you need to endeavour to do, it's something that visitors absolutely expect and that's going to pay dividends when it comes to the advocacy and word of mouth marketing coming back. And then the third thing, uh, which our friend here from the BBC is going to talk about, uh, is mobile. Um, at every single stage in the visitor cycle, you see mobile impacting it. And I think, you know, if we had spoken in this room two years ago, we would have really focused in the in-trip experience stage of the cycle and said, well, this is where mobile is really important. But right now, all of the research points to the fact that mobile is not just important uh, when people are in the destination. We're seeing a huge trend towards multi-screening, uh, where people are actually consuming media across multiple devices. And that really points to the fact that this is an important uh, medium, uh, even when it comes to uh, gaining inspiration, uh, when people don't necessarily look for specific information. So trends are changing, and mobile is uh, absolutely the thing which is changing everything right now. Uh, here's just a quick snapshot at uh, uh, some statistics I pulled from eMarketeer, which basically show smart penetration across the world. What you can see is that there are very large variations, um, notably South Africa, um, only 19%, so it's a very low penetration, compared to the Asian economies, which are really driving um, smartphone adoption. If you look at South Korea, for example, uh, we're talking 82% uh, adoption there, really, really high. Um, and other Asian economies are also really the fast ones to uptake uh, new technology, and also social media as well. So it's these uh, emerging economies which are the fastest growing when it comes to smartphones um, and they're the ones that are going to change things uh, dramatically in the years to come. And really what it's all about, and I don't want to dive into too much uh, research to support this case, I thought I would just get straight to the point. Um, it's really about these digital natives. So this is the, um, the, the new generation of sort of under 35 travellers that for them, they don't, do not see uh, a clear distinction between what we as marketeers or business owners might say, let's do an online campaign or let's do an offline campaign. For this generation, there is no online and offline. The two worlds are completely converged. And this is really important just to understand. Um, and I think the best way to describe it is just to say, you need to get it. You need to understand how young people are using technology because the visitor experience that we talk about is more and more going to become uh, a digital experience and then that digital experience will become completely inherent to the, dig to the visitor experience. 
So the two will not be two different things. They will actually be the same thing. So I'm going to look at three key points um, and just focus on some examples which I think illustrate some of these changes uh, that we're seeing at the moment. The first is what I refer to, well, not just myself, a lot of people are now referring to more and more as the C to C economy. That is your visitors uh, doing, uh, transacting with other visitors and effectively cutting out the big brands. Now, this is uh, very disruptive uh, and it's very challenging to know how to, um, how to adapt your business uh, to these changes. But nonetheless, it's a reality and we're starting to see the impact of that. So it's important to understand why and how this is happening. Uh, I was recently doing some work for a client in Germany and we were looking at what people had written about Germany online and we just Googled um, Frankfurt and this was uh, one of the people who came to the top of the Google search results. Uh, does anybody know who this person is? Nobody? Good, because she's not famous. <laughs> I, was, I would be worried if somebody put up their hands. Um, uh, and actually, uh, there is a, a, a slight in-joke about a caravan. Uh, it's a, um, a lady from Holland who is actually, uh, she's a student on a gap year and she's doing uh, a city trip around Europe and she's basically writing a blog. She is not famous, she's not even hugely influential, but she is massively important um, in, in terms of a content strategy because she is writing uh, really amazing content pieces about all the cities she visits and her content is actually very well search engine optimized. So this is one of the biggest challenges that businesses and destinations have is that these are the new marketeers, these are the people which are driving interest um, and we have to understand and learn how to work with them and how to build them into our own strategies. Um, I pulled up a piece of research uh, that was conducted. Uh, they actually presented to consumers um, a set of images, uh, both images which were stock photography about uh, many different alpine destinations and images which were user-generated content uh, about the same alpine destinations. And the results were really revealing. They actually uh, discovered that those destinations that use what we would refer to as classical or stock photography um, just had far, far less resonance with the consumers who looked at them. Uh, that's to say they had a lower recollection rate uh, when they asked them later on uh, which uh, image related to which destination. They couldn't exactly recall that. Um, and they had less authenticity compared to the user-generated photos. Now, I thought this was a really interesting study because it does make the point about the importance of authentic user-generated content when it's coming from influential peers as opposed to that, as we said, very nice glossy photography which uh, perhaps looks uh, very nice at that first point but it doesn't have any kind of lasting impact on, on travellers. Um, and really this is what it's all about, storytelling. Uh, this is some photographs actually I took from um, a recent trip I did with some bloggers um, in South Africa in Cape Town. And uh, they just created, 10 bloggers created amazing experiences about uh, their trip to the city. Uh, they did everything from bungee jumping off cliffs uh, to, to all sorts of things. And the content that they produced was very, very powerful and inspiring. And this is the kind of content that uh, as a business you just can't commission. It's something that you need to, um, to actually stimulate and uh, create the right environment for the happening. This is really uh, the changing content at that early awareness stage, building this, um, bu building this real experiences into the overall marketing mix. But um, it is still important to have a, a tight control over any brand as a business or a destination. And I am certainly not the person to stand here and tell you just let go of your brand give it to your customers, give it to your uh, consumers and let them just do whatever with it. Um, it's really important to have a strong strategy, uh, a very well managed brand, but, and that should be at the center. Your high end professional stuff should be right at the center of your strategy. But all the stuff that goes around it, which is probably 80% of the noise, is actually all of the real stories. These are all the real experiences created by others which support your brand. And all these messages actually um, back up everything that you say and prove that it is what you say it is. So they're really important. I um, just, uh, before coming here, I just did a little bit of extra research to see um, where things are going. And I found a very interesting, uh, I always knew of Intercontinental. First of all, I should probably ask, is there anybody from IHG Group in the room? Great, okay. We'll probably have a little chat afterwards. 
um, it, it, it came to my attention that maybe the strategy is not quite right here because um, I think this is great and actually it stood out for me for a number of years the focus on the concierge, the fact that the Intercontinental Hotel is the concierge, the local know-how on the destination. And I think this is great. This um, shows the importance of the customer in the business, the uh, importance of the hotel in providing that local knowledge. Um, but there are some changes uh, which may maybe uh, would make you reconsider this as a strategic uh, approach. I, I pulled up uh, the iPad application for Intercontinental, which I also thought was great. Really nicely presented, really good content. It reads like a magazine. Lots of great tips on where to go, all published by Intercontinental. But there was one problem here, and that is that it didn't have the feel, the authenticity, that this is something that's created by real customers, by real users who really know the city. It's, if you like, uh, an image that's being presented and customers are now moving much more towards an advanced stage where they understand the differences between local knowledge and real uh, tips shared by other travellers. Uh, here's just an example. This just uh, came to me last night when I arrived in the city. A push notification uh, telling me what other people like in the surroundings. This is real local knowledge. Um, and this is something that's fairly uncontrolled from a, a branding point of view. Um, but it's, it's about understanding that full, uh, full implementation of that in your strategy and how you can actually use that. That's where you can have really good results. Um, I pulled up uh, some other examples of uh, ways in which this kind of content is perhaps well managed. Uh, we work with a company called Everplaces, uh, which creates uh, mobile, um, they have a kind of mobile social sphere where they allow people to share tips and experiences which matter to them most, and they really focus on different niches. Um, and as you can see here, uh, this is um, a profile of an illustrator who's shared all of his favorite places. And people are more and more identifying with individuals like this. So if I consider myself to have similar interests uh, to Chris, I may like some of the same places that he's picked and shared. And so that, for me as a visitor, uh, has much more relevance. Does anybody know what this photograph uh, relates to or where it's from? Nobody? Wow, you, you guys don't watch the news, huh? This was two days ago, I think two or three days ago. Um, this was all the taxi drivers in uh, five or six cities in Europe all going on strike. Uh, because of the uh, new rise of Uber. I'm assuming a lot of you have heard of Uber. Yeah, okay, good. I would be worried if not. Um, well, whatever you think about Uber, it is a reality of the changing trends, uh, not just in the travel industry, but online and how th technology is disrupting traditional ways of doing things. Uber, uh, for those of you who don't know, is uh, a, a taxi app which actually charges your ride based on your GPS and your distance and they connect you with other drivers. Uh, the controversy here is that they're not necessarily taxi drivers, uh, they're not necessarily licensed taxi drivers and obviously the uh, taxi unions are, are very, very unhappy about this. But we've seen similar things here with uh, Airbnb. Now I know you all know about Airbnb and many of you probably don't appreciate the presence of Airbnb. It's seen by many as completely unfair competition and certainly a very disruptive element in the accommodation sector, but they are now the largest uh, accommodation booking site on the web. So again, like it or loathe it, you have to look at what's happening here and take the learnings and build that into your business because uh, as much as you can protest, uh, these sites are not going to go away. And actually, with the, with the case of Uber, the protests only uh, caused the result of strengthening the awareness. They had the CEO on every single news channel capitalizing on it, explaining to all the people who had never heard of Uber exactly what it is and how they can use it. So they really didn't do themselves any favors there. Um, and actually, what we see is even uh, a site like Airbnb hasn't just stopped at connecting travelers with locals. They've actually gone much, much further because they continue to understand the importance of this growing trend and not to be complacent about their position. So uh, very recently they launched uh, what they call a kind of locals or neighborhood experts where they actually encourage locals to share 
uh, all their tips and tricks about the local destinations. So going even further, providing that local knowledge and connecting uh, visitors or travelers with locals. This is, um, this is if you like, uh, the approach that Intercontinental have taken, but on a huge, huge scale and actually taking it right down to the customer level. Um, so they've done a great job and it's actually very inspiring. So um, what do we learn from that? We have to see what's happening here and understand how to uh, ad adapt our own business to reflect the changes which people are actually looking for and expecting here. As you can see, just a few examples, really nice, very personal, actually very simple content showing the real side to a city rather than the glossy brochure side to a city. And actually very inspiring. Um, I pulled up just, uh, just earlier today actually some statistics from a recent Nielsen report uh, where they actually conducted a survey uh, amongst uh, several thousand online users to see which, um, which users were more likely to share their own assets and also to you make the use of other people's shared assets. And this really demonstrates uh, the change we're seeing. This uh, represents the uh, tendency to, or the interest in sharing um, other people's or sharing from other people. And actually what surprised me most is that the Asia Pacific is right at the top. I would have thought that Europeans, us Europeans, are probably more likely to share with each other, but that seems not to be the case. Um, so we see this change, uh, we see this trend, and we see who's driving that as well. Their study revealed that this uh, millennials, so roughly those digital natives, uh, that are really the ones driving that uh, much, much higher than any other age group. These are the generation that are very comfortable with communicating and transacting with complete strangers online. And this is the generation which sees less and re less relevance in brands and more and more relevance in their peers. And obviously this generation is only going to grow up and become more and more the mainstream. So it's really important to take note of this trend uh, now and to get onto it while you still can. Moving on to the next uh, point, the 360 view on product and price that customers have. Uh, we all know about the, the main things which are impacting things here. Uh, believe what they read on the tin and they go to extra sites, they look for more information, they want to verify, verify and verify everything they see and make sure that what they're about to buy, that that city trip experience they're about to take is really going to be the experience they, they expect. And they don't want any surprises when they, when they go either. They, they want to do all of their research online and ensure there are no surprises whatsoever. Uh, we see this uh, in every single aspect of the web. Here's a very simple, uh, everybody knows Street View. Um, this is just another element of having this very transparent view on product, on what you're about to buy, and being able to check out every aspect first. As, a, as an online travel agent, it's really important that you provide all of this within your site, because if you don't have your TripAdvisor reviews and ratings, your visitor will just leave that site and check on TripAdvisor and they might actually discover your competitor which has a better rating. So you have to build that in. And likewise with things like Street View and all these other things, the more you include in your overall presentation of your business or your destination, the more confirmed your visitors are going to be about the decisions they're about to take, the less sources they will actually go to. Um, likewise as well, I did a conference on Friday and one of the topics was big data and we were struggling a little bit to find you know, how and where this fits in tourism, which is quite interesting in itself. But I think one example here is uh, Kayak's um, price prediction. It's a very good example of how consumers, without any knowledge of data or programming or anything, are tapping into the powers of data processing. Uh, Kayak actually, um, they, they monitor all of the different price trends and then they tell visitors if it's a good time to book or not. This uh, really damages your strategy if your strategy is to increase or lower prices at certain times in the year because as a customer you can basically look at that and say, okay, I need to wait seven more days before the, the price is most likely to drop based on their statistics. And the last uh, point, uh, which is for me the, the big one, uh, which is really impacting everything, and I think it leads on to our next speaker quite nicely, is the impact of mobile in every single sense, from M commerce through to uh, enhancing the experience in the destination. Mobile is changing everything. Uh, as we can see here, this, um, this is a video that I took off of the Apple website. Some of you may have seen it on the television. Uh, I don't need to play the video. Uh, you're welcome to go and look at it, but we're not advertising for Apple here. The, what I like here is at the end of the video, their brand message is you are more powerful than you think. 
And I think um, this is uh, very, very symbolic of how technology has developed and how a company like Apple has been at the forefront of uh, pushing the boundaries. What they are saying here is that with that piece of technology in your pocket, you can basically do almost anything. And that's a key message to take away with. There are almost, uh, almost nothing is out of bounds in terms of what your customers can do. Um, so I pulled up a few examples, uh, a few examples which are perhaps not being used that much at the moment, but certainly uh, hint to where things will go in the future. Uh, this is one of my favorite apps. It's, um, it allows you to actually um, speak into your microphone and it will translate directly what you've, uh, what you've said to somebody in front of you. So if you walk into a bar in Spain and you don't speak any Spanish, you can simply speak to them in English, hold your phone and it will translate and speak that same phrase in Spanish. So this changes everything because there are no more language barriers, <clears throat> there are no more limits where you can't go off the beaten track into a not very touristy area. We were speaking uh, this morning and Hans made some very good comments about uh, dispersion of visitors and mobile is very powerful in terms of being able to support a dispersion strategy. But uh, things like this also make it very accessible from a tourist point of view. Now, this is just an app. It may not be that widely used at the moment, but we see a huge move towards a huge investment from all the technology companies in voice recognition and things like this. So we can certainly expect this to become much more familiar and mainstream in the future. So a really big trend that's going to be coming up here. Um, this is also a great uh, app, which is now being bought by Google, which tells you probably that it's going to be quite big in the future. Um, this is WorldLens. It allows you to hold your phone up and it will instantly change the text on a sign or a book uh, to your own language. And that's just incredible. I, was even, I see a lot of technology, but when I tried this, I was gobsmacked. Um, it's, uh, well, I can just show you the video here. And I think you can see for yourself just how powerful this could be. You get the idea there. Um, the, what's, great, what's really fascinating about this is that it has been bought by Google. It is actually also offline. So in the tourism industry, we're always talking about the need uh, to consider the issues around roaming. But here, there are no issues around roaming. They've actually managed to engineer the technology to work offline. And the fact that it's bought by Google, you can pretty much expect this to be more and more integrated into the everyday use of phones and apps in the future. So again, huge opportunity for tourism that's coming, which will allow you to really open up areas of a destination which uh, maybe weren't that accessible for people who couldn't enter without language skills. So I think language is actually going to, to change quite a lot, um, far from everybody learning to speak English. Um, so augmenting the experience is also something which is really transforming how people see cities. This is an app from The Shard in London. I don't know if anybody's had the opportunity to go up there. Maybe just raise your hand. Has anybody used this app? Wow. <laughs> yes, great. Okay, so good. I'm glad there's someone in here. This allows you to have an augmented re uh, reality view of the city and see all the points of interest there. Again, really helping you as a visitor maybe cut out the guide and actually see uh, yourself and discover everything. So it's a completely different way of traveling and exploring. Uh, this, uh, we don't need the sound for this. This is, a, um, this is an app released by the city of Stockholm. Uh, it also shows how things are, are moving in terms of the experience that you have in the destination. They actually created an app which we could consider some sort of gamification, where they actually encourage people to discover the city by going around and listening to different sound bites and snippets uh, all over the city and, um, and sort of playing with that and collecting points as they do that. So we see really creative examples, a lot of experimental work taking place. Uh, where they're actually allowing people to just discover new things using their smartphones. Um, again, here we see uh, this is the Holiday Inn during the Olympics. 
they had athletes performing inside the hotels just by holding your smartphone up and seeing the, your hotel come to life. Uh, they also had athletes in your hotel room, uh, which uh, was quite interesting, I think. Um, and we can also see examples of how this is being in, used in museums to bring things which don't even exist anymore to life as well. So really uh, clear, specific examples of how that can actually support um, something very important, uh, like bringing back dinosaurs or bringing back a piece of heritage or culture that's gone from a city. So it can really actually help uh, reinvent somewhere that doesn't necessarily have the tangible um, product in front of it. Uh, this is a great example of uh, Tokyo Aquarium, where the mobile uh, guide actually let, had penguins leading people to the zoo. Um, I thought this was a really cute example, and I definitely recommend you check it out if you get a chance. Um, but also I want to talk about the commerce opportunities which are evolving in mobile. Um, we see a huge, huge and very steep rise in mobile commerce. Um, partly in, due to the familiarity that people have with mobile technology. Also, a lot of work has been done to reassure people when it comes to security issues. Um, and we see very unique business models emerging out of this. One in particular is Hotels Tonight, uh, which is a business that has developed only out of the mobile revolution. Hotels Tonight allows you to book uh, discounted accommodation only on the day and only when you're in the city. And their entire business is all about mobile. But the fact that they have been so successful at what they have done shows where there are new opportunities uh, in the tourism sector actually coming out of technology. So it's not all bad, it's not all changing. There are definitely new and exciting things coming as well. Uh, also I thought that Viator, is there anyone from Viator in the room? No? Okay. Viator, do uh, they have one of the best apps I've seen, uh, really demonstrates the opportunity to upsell within the destination. Uh, very simple pulling your location, showing you tours and things that you might like to do whilst you're there and allowing you to very quickly in four steps go through and actually buy that. So again, without anybody else competing in this space, they have the complete reign of the opportunity there. Um, and some recent statistics uh, that we pulled up which show also that people are very happy to uh, give away some of their personal information if it will actually enhance or improve their trip experience. So whilst we think that, especially in the UK, that people are very protective about their personal data, if you can demonstrate that it will actually improve their experience, they may be more willing to share certain things. And this survey looked at what people would look for. Things like ordering room service, using your phone as a key to enter your hotel and things like this were all considered really uh, interesting and things people would like to do with their smartphones. Um, and the main thing is obviously the opportunity of real-time information. This is, just, um, this is just my home screen from my phone. It's an example of how many travelers are just using mobile every day to improve the whole travel experience. And as a city destination or as a business in the city, you have to think first when it comes to mobile about how to improve the functionality and usefulness and seamlessness of your customer experience. That is the first thing to think about when it comes to mobile, not necessarily the marketing opportunity uh, that perhaps is usually the first goal. Uh, very simple things which basically help to improve the whole trip experience. This is a recent trip I did to uh, Copenhagen. It just shows the, the number of different apps that have been used, um, the number of different uh, tools which are used to help support that trip. And this is more and more becoming the norm, people arriving and people putting together their trip uh, plan as they go, so rather than planning everything in advance. Uh, when it comes to mobile, um, this at the moment, so you might think of the sort of experience ecosystem is made up of a number of different things, uh, what people, customers know about your business, uh, what experience they have about it, uh, what experience they have as users on your website, and then, of course, uh, what the mobile experience is, is part of that. It's a small part, probably, for most of you. But you have to really consider this new generation, going back to that first uh, slide about the digital natives, and consider your customers that only experience your, your destination or your uh, business through mobile. For those who only experience your business through mobile, that is their whole experience. So if you think that it's not important to optimize and to heavily optimize and improve every aspect of your mobile presence, consider the people who only enter and only reach your brand through mobile. That's all they know about you. So it perhaps changes the way you look at mobile as an opportunity. 
Uh, that's all I have to say. I think it's a good point to move on to our next speaker. So I'm looking forward to taking your questions uh, later on. Thanks very much. I, will move straight on. I think we will move straight on because these two presentations have a lot in common. I mean, they'll be consistent in this sense. Though I'm tempted to ask Nick, one thing I'm always struck personally, I said this to Tom uh, Jenkins before we began today, is what I want is an app when I arrive in a new city that tells me how to buy the best ticket on the transit system. I'm sure there's one of those. I'd love to know what it is. Anybody got one? I'd like it. Uh, now, we're going to hear next from Helen Thompson from BBC Mobile. Helen. Over 50% of users to BBC now come via a mobile device. That sounds really impressive, right? But then you look at Facebook, over 70% of their users come via a mobile device. I'm Helen Thompson, I'm Head of Product for Global News Limited, and I'm here today to talk to you about how some of the great ideas, which um, Nick brought up earlier, can be translated into a digital strategy for your businesses and commercial opportunities. We've got a changing customer, and whether you're in news, social media, retail or travel, your business is changing. So a little bit about BBC. Most of you will be aware of BBC. We recently ran a survey, which I think said in the UK, the BBC brand um, is recognised more than God. So um, <laughs> most of you have probably heard of us once or twice. We're quite a big place. Um, so just to give you a little bit of context about where I fit in. I work for the commercial arm of the BBC. We provide a news and sport products digitally and internationally, across a range of platforms, right from the BBC World News television channel, through to the website, through to the mobile sites, BBC news apps, and also on social media. We reach 380 million households worldwide, and we reach 76 million users. All our services are completely free to the user, but we commercialise them via advertising to bring revenue back into the BBC. As we're a commercial business, it's obviously quite expensive to run across five different platforms. So why do we do that? Let's talk first a little bit about who BBC users are internationally for news and sport. BBC news users, it might surprise you to know, internationally outside the UK are generally not expats. That only accounts for about 4% of our traffic. They tend to be affluent, highly educated business people. And they tend to have a strong interest in world affairs, hence why they come to the BBC. They also like to travel. So the stats on screen now, which we ran in one of our recent surveys, will come as no surprise to you. 86% of the BBC audience had had a holiday over 2012-13, or were planning a holiday over the next year. Those users, our users, they're also your users in many situations. So, I won't dwell on this too much, as I'm sure you know far more about it than I do, but we all know, even me, that any holiday starts with the planning. What we're interested in today is how users do that planning and what platforms they use to do that. When we run our surveys, TV is about inspiration and ideas. Digital is about details and information. And there's two things which really strike me when you look at this. As the devices get smaller, the relationship gets more personal with the user. And also, as the device gets smaller, the information that users are looking for is more specific. That's true for both news and for travel. If we take um, a couple of examples here. For TV, if you're interested in potentially booking a holiday to Brazil, you might have recorded David Beckham's latest programme on BBC around Brazil. You'll have recorded that on your TV to share with the rest of your family or whoever you're planning to go on holiday with. That's because TV is a one-to-many experience. You share that TV with whoever else is watching that TV. So it's great for inspiration, it's great for getting across big ideas. It's not a particularly personal relationship. As you go down through the screen sizes, that relationship gets more personal. Think about your desktop or your laptop. That maybe belongs to work. So, 
it's a one-to-one -one relationship while you're using it. Although there's probably the person at work in IT who's checking all your emails, so you know, it's, it's, just, it's not quite as personal. You share that with other people perhaps at work or in the family. Tablets often shared between several members of the family. Mobile phones really different because that tends to be the one device that is a one-to-one -one relationship. Most people feel particularly nervous if anybody, regardless of whether they're family members, spouses or friends, takes their mobile phone from them and what they might be doing with that. <laughs> so if we go back to our example around travel, while you might use the TV for inspiration to hear about what's going on in Brazil at the moment because of the World Cup, if, you're lucky, if whilst you're out in Brazil, it's your wife's, yours and your wife's 25th wedding anniversary, you're probably not going to use your work computer or the family computer to book champagne for the room. You're probably going to do that on mobile because that's a one-to-one -one personal relationship. It's no different for news. Customers know what they want and instinctively they go to the right device to get that. One of the things that we've got to get away from thinking is that these are always different users. A mobile user may be a desktop user in another situation. Um, we had some great examples earlier um, from Nick around how mobile is particularly um, important in certain cat categories and age groups, and it is. In those categories and age groups, mobile may be where they go first more than in the older categories and age groups. But one of the things that we've got to remember is most teenagers still have a television in the bedroom. So it's not exclusive, it's dependent on a number of different factors. We see the same thing with news. Two thirds of our users use different devices for consuming different ways, of it, for different ways of consuming the news. So people work across platform. And why do they choose different devices for different, in different situations? Size matters, a lady says. But it's not the most important thing, gentlemen, you'll be pleased to know. There are also a number of factors which affect how you choose which device to use. And one of the most important when we ask our BBC News users is occasion and setting. We talked earlier about how we now regularly receive over 50% of all page views coming from a mobile device. The first time that that happened was on Christmas Day. The reason for that is the occasion and setting. It's not acceptable to leave the dinner table because you're bored of the conversation and go use the PC, you can use your mobile phone slightly more discreetly, perhaps. Another thing which is very important is the time of day and the routines. You may have seen graphs like this before. Television, we're all very familiar with. The television you put on in the morning, maybe watch BBC Breakfast, maybe watch Good Morning Britain, if that's the way you are. Um, towards the end of the day, in the evening, we all, you, you go back to the television and you watch it as a family. Tablet also peaks in the evening. Tends to be people um, looking at um, things in it, more information whilst they're watching the television. So your television is your inspiration, but you're also sitting in your tablet looking for more information, whether it be related to what's on the television or something slightly different. It is more consistent throughout the day, though, tablet. Desktop peaks at lunchtime, um, is very popular during the day, and we all kn know that we, oh, most of us will sit in front of a desktop for most of our working day, and lunchtime is the time people look at news, they book holidays, um, and they catch up on all of those sort of things. Mobile, very consistent throughout the day, but also peaks at lunchtime. One of the important things to know is that if you add mobile and tablet together, that peak is higher than desktop or television. So these mobile devices are important. If I'd have been sitting, or standing even, as I am, um, in front of you three, five years ago, we would have been talking about the big question in mobile, which was, and still is to some extent, browser, and websites, or apps. When I first started out in mobile, um, in the days of Java apps and SMS, we thought it was all about the website. We thought that apps would never take off. Java apps were incredibly difficult to use, incredibly difficult to find. They would go into games, no one would be able to find them. So it was a really difficult user experience. I remember distinctly pitching to one of my seniors saying apps will never take off. 
I think it was about six months later that Apple launched iPhone. And we had a slight change of strategy, as you can imagine. And then it was all about apps. But then after Apple launched iPhone and iPad, then came along Android devices, BlackBerry 10, Windows 8. And all of a sudden, there's so many devices that it's actually really hard and really expensive to create apps for all of those. So then we went back to browser. But really, today, where we are, we need both. And this is why. We're talking about two different products on one platform. So we talked about how platforms are uh, important, but why would we need two different products on the same platform? This is still a mobile or a tablet, regardless of which way you access content. We've got two benchmarks of success, really, in the digital media world. One is around page views, which is the number of pages that people look at. Equally in retail, it is probably the size of your basket. It's how often people are coming back to you, really. Um, the other one is about unique browsers, so the number of devices which are coming to you. You'll see the two graphs there. If we use desktop as benchmark, and you can see that that's quite consistent in terms of the page views and the number of users that are coming to it. Then we take mobile, and in this case we're talking about the mobile website. Slightly lower on the page views, slightly higher on the number of users coming. So what actually happens in effect is people come to our site and they look at a couple of things. They don't look at everything. They don't look as much, uh, as much as the desktop users do. They come for specific information and they leave. Tablet, quite similar to desktop, not a huge difference in experience there. But the one big differentiator which you will see in yellow is apps. Apps is a relatively small part of our user base, but they're hugely loyal in terms of how often they come back to us and in terms of the number of pages they look at. It is very important. These apps users are some of our most valuable users. Why are they quite small in terms of numbers? Well, we can only provide apps on certain platforms for iOS and Android. We're never going to get anyone, everyone. We have huge traffic that comes from markets where iOS and Android perhaps aren't the most prevalent. But the important thing for app users is that they are super engaged. So let's just talk a bit about our apps. So as we heard earlier, you can have app-specific features which are really good for pushing engagement as well. You can have push notifications. We do them for news and sport. Um, you can also have them for travel. You, many of you will have apps that already use those features. I think one of the important things about apps is that they do one thing well. They have to start with a user problem. There's a problem that you want to solve. And if you think about your favourite apps, they tend to fulfil one need really, really well. And the reason for that is it's got to justify its position on the home screen. And actually, that first screenshot is the most important in terms of why apps are so successful. Because if you can get that space on the home screen, it becomes really easy. Really easy to come back to your product, to come back to your site, to spend more, to view more pages. You might need several apps. You might need a range of apps that appeal to different users. Because if you're doing one thing well, you're probably only targeting one part of the market. So you might need to provide a suite of apps. The frustrating thing about apps is that they're all about brand loyalty. Sadly, if someone's never heard of BBC News, they're unlikely to wake up tomorrow with an epiphany and go, must download the BBC News app as much as that would help me with my targets. And sadly, that does not happen. So then that brings us on to our sites. Why are our sites important if we've already got apps? They're very engaging, people love them. Why are our sites still important? Well, our sites are about reach. You search on Google for a holiday and it comes back with a range of providers. You might not know which provider you want to go with. You might not have got that brand loyalty yet. They might not be aware of you yet. You have to have a good site to be able to bring those users in. One of the challenges we've got with our mobile site is that we get, on average, over 7,000 different device types every week coming to our mobile site. Sadly, in BBC, we don't have 7,000 developers. I know sometimes the license fee feels like a lot of money, but we don't have that many developers. So we need to be able to manage that 
number of users coming in on different devices consistently. And the way that we do that is by using what we call a responsive site. And all of this means is that it's one code base, one code base which can work from right down feature phones, your most basic Nokia, the phone that your granny's had for 600 years, right all the way up to smartphones, tablets, desktops, and even televisions. And what that's about is about providing a consistent experience across devices. It doesn't have to include all of the same content. You might not want to put all of the content on your desktop site, on the mobile site, because you actually know that in the mobile experience, this is what people are looking for. But it does mean that there's a consistency in the general experience, and it means you only update your code base once. So it means each time that you make a change, it's reflected across all devices where it needs to be. It's about standardising the experience so that everyone gets a good experience, regardless of what phone they've chosen to have or what tablet. We've also done something similar for advertising. Um, all of our revenue comes from advertising, and um, we have worked hard to try and standardise that as well, because it's important that everyone is across all devices. So if our users across all devices, our advertisers need to be too. So we've worked on creating a display advertising unit and a video pre-roll advertising unit, which will work across multiple platforms. I'll give you a bit of time to just read this quote. This comes from a news user, but equally it could come from a user of any of your travel sites. TV creates inspiration. It's curated content, has lots of detail, but it might not give everyone all of the answers. It's not that personal experience. You can't tailor it to yourself. Laptop and desktop is about digging deeper. It's about having control. It's about the opportunity to go off the beaten track. Tablet is your gateway to the world. After being inspired by TV, it's the perfect second screen. Smartphone is your constant companion. There are lots of surveys out there now which say people would rather go out without their house keys and their wallet than the mobile phone. People always have their mobile phone on, you, on them and they use it when they have to, when they don't have any other option around screens and also when they just want that personal um, information that they are looking for, when they want to have that personal relationship and they have that very specific thing that they want to do. Every screen has a place. Right now, there's four. In the future, there may be more. Google are putting a lot of money behind wearable technologies, um, and the number of screen sizes may increase. Just as we think we've got a mobile strategy, we don't have a mobile strategy. That's the one thing I've learned. But we need to be where our customers are. And right now, they're across all of these four screens. Thank you. Right, um, now, a fascinating pair of presentations there on a number of issues about the way in which people increasingly use um, the internet and devices to inform the way they buy and inform each other uh, about tourism of various kinds, and then the different ways we use different forms of hardware at different times. Um, with all sorts of powerful implications, I'm guessing, for everybody in the room. Um, anybody would like to start? Yes, before I start myself. Good then, afternoon. Uh, Hello. Uh, it's just a, a quick question to, to Nick. Obviously, you focus very much on the experience that customers are having. I suppose the biggest single influencing factor for a customer's experience is that is the member of staff they're dealing with, not necessarily the technology you use to get there. Um, and you, you, you mentioned a couple of apps that are, you know, language converters and all of that. I would hazard a guess that the vast majority of people who download that are not downloading it for the purpose it's intended. Do we have any quantifiable studies that say that this technology is being used and is enhancing a customer's experience, as opposed to it looks great, it sounds great, but actually I'm using it down the pub with my mates. Uh, I have to say, we, yeah, that's a very good question, actually. Um, we, 
We do ourselves look at a lot of different reports and research which comes out, and we've never come across um, any really good research which shows how all the different apps are being used. Um, we are actually, uh, just doing my own plug here, we're actually doing a uh, workshop in Amsterdam in, in a few weeks' time where we will actually explore this subject uh, with real visitors to see this. But uh, I think your instinct probably tells you that yeah, a lot of people download these because they have a good gimmick. They maybe use them, they maybe share them, they maybe delete them, but do they actually use them in the way that I described? And uh, without any uh, research to back that up, you're probably right, that's what I can say. But I think uh, the opportunity is there, and the opportunity is there for somebody to get it right and for somebody to build that kind of technology in to a functional uh, purpose. Um, as, as I was saying uh, about the different tools, and as, as you also said, is that it's really important to think about the very specific and clear purpose that the app serves. Um, there's no, uh, most, uh, de most brands or destinations or businesses which take a sort of all-in-one app approach usually don't do very well because you have to have a very, very focused uh, purpose in terms of what your app provides. So I think the opportunity is to use these kind of tools uh, in a really smart and sophisticated way. And there are plenty of good examples of how various different types of technology have been integrated into very successful apps. So it's probably more interesting to look at these successful apps and which, what are the components which actually make them very successful. Have you any, I mean, can I just ask the question, have you any sense of how they might be used in a way that I mean, for example, of how they might be used other than, I mean, I think that your question included the idea that not only they might not be used at all, but they might be used for something else. Is that, is that what I was picking up? Well, well, basically, yeah, you can imagine that the majority of people who are downloading that translation, you know, you're not, part of the experience of going to Spain or to a foreign country is actually standing at the bar and trying to order a beer in that language and getting it wrong. That's part of the experience of travel, surely. And, and talking into a phone so it translated for you is not going to improve your experience. Well, I did wonder myself. I mean, the removal, I mean, if you played it forward, I take your point entirely. If you removed all mystery from all travel, <clears throat> it wouldn't make it a very, I mean, it would slightly defeat the object, wouldn't it? Uh, actually, no. I think um, using that app with uh, locals could be hilarious, to be honest. <laughs> so I think it would actually create a very unique experience. Sort of French widow in a Sitting bedroom. in a pub, yeah. uh, having a conversation through a phone. I would have a lot of fun with that. But um, I think if you uh, take maybe simpler examples, uh, whilst this technology is here, I would still say it's future technology because it's not widely used. If you take the example of QR codes, which came several years ago, um, a lot of people raise questions about them. But there are some really good examples of how uh, they have been now integrated into apps and used in a really good way. One which really stands out for me, and it's unfortunately not travel, is uh, McDonald's in France they actually integrate a QR scanner and they allow you to somehow uh, purchase inside McDonald's using the QR scanner. Uh, and there are m examples of uh, payment solutions as well in Belgium where you can send money to a friend and your friend scans your phone and you effectively exchange money like that. So there are lots of really good examples of how new technology is being integrated. I think that's the thing to look out for. I would say World Lens as an app on its own probably, yeah, probably won't uh, change much from what it is now. But I think that kind of technology will start to become used um, in other apps. I also think it's about whether the market problem is actually strong enough. So, you know, like, like you alluded to, there, there is some sort of fun in trying to sort of battle your way through in a lot of situations. Maybe there is actually an English version of the menu. Maybe you can work it out for yourself. But you can see that in situations there would be certain situations where people may use that technology and um, at the moment they might be edge cases. So maybe, um, you know, like for example, if you, if you were at the hospital and you had an issue, you might use one of those translation apps because you've got no other option, you're not really sure how to get your message across. Then the market problem becomes really strong and that user problem becomes really strong. I think in general probably part of the issue with the app is that people quite like that problem. It's maybe not a huge problem for them. Yeah, I think Helen is completely right, actually. Uh, sorry, Helen. <laughs> um, I think uh, whenever you approach a mobile strategy, one of the first things you say is, what problems are we going to solve? And you have to think, what, are, what problems will our visitor have, and how do we solve that? And that's taking customer 
-huh. or a user-centric approach. Um, of course, there are examples where you effectively create solutions to problems which don't exist, um, and that obviously depends on your strategy then. But yeah, you're, you're exactly right. Okay, there's a question over here. Um, thanks for that. I found it really fascinating. Um, I'm from Cater and Hotel Keeper magazine, so I'm interested in how businesses can make themselves more approachable um, and market themselves in the best possible way. Um, I have maybe a two-part question basically about, particularly you mentioned IHG um, and bloggers. Um, a lot of the time people accuse big corporations of trying to be all matey online and responding to people and getting involved in Twitter banter and all that stuff and sometimes people say that it backfires and where do you think the line is between getting involved in social media in that kind of generation Y way and where is it too much and where does glossy meet non-glossy I guess is my question. <laughs> Um, I, I had a feeling uh, that putting IHG in the <laughs> presentation would get me in some trouble. Um, so I'm uh, not surprised it came up. I think the, um, the, to answer your question, uh, there, are, there, is no, um, th there is no benchmark that you can copy. You can only learn from, uh, from your competitors and what's happening and how consumer behavior is changing. What is really important to remember is that your brand is still really, really important. And I think what Intercontinental have done is, is actually really good. But the problem here is that the consumer is always one step ahead and now they're looking for opinions from other customers more and more. But um, you know, if you go to some you know, more traditional form of media, such as a promotional video, some of the most successful promotional videos uh, right now actually incorporate a mix. So um, you, you see a lot of examples. Coca-Cola just released a commercial where they did a mix of user-generated content uh, sharing their happiness and their own professional content. And there's so many examples of this where uh, very high-end, slick professional stuff is mixed with uh, very amateur stuff. What this allows a brand to do is have a very tight and strong control over the identity of the brand and the message that they want to communicate but still push uh, the authentic, uh, yeah, authenticity through everything they do, which people relate to. So that's actually very, very powerful. Okay. So I think the combination of the two is what works really well. Yeah, and I think it's about getting the voice of your brand right. Just because you're on social media, that doesn't mean you need to talk differently necessarily. Um, there's certain ways that you would not expect the BBC to talk, and it may be that there's lots of examples of people doing some really successful things, but you know, to the users, BBC has a certain voice. If we started being like, oh, you're all right, mate, that would not really be the voice that people expect the BBC to speak with. So I think um, you shouldn't feel undue pressure to, to, to communicate in a different way because you're on a different platform. I think the other thing is I don't, I don't think you should be afraid of it because I think actually... You know, it, it's been something that we've had to reconcile in sort of a media business. You know, um, we have a lot of, all we have is our content online to sell. And our content is all online. So um, in terms of like giving that content to other parties, and in terms of working with people like um, Flipboard and, and other companies, um, which is sort of the challenge in the media industry, I don't think you can shy away from that. And I think it's the same with social media. You, you need to be there. Um, and so you need not to not be afraid, but it is good to have a clear strategy as to what you're trying to do, and you need to do that in the right way with the right tone of voice. Because I mean, sometimes I think the brands lose that. But this does take us into the postmodern world of what you might call apparent authenticity, doesn't it? What you're trying to do, or a corporation is trying to do, is in a way that some politicians are capable of doing, which is be apparently authentic, and you can't tell whether it's authentic or not. I mean, that is the, the, the mirror-filled room that this takes us into, isn't it? Yeah, right. I love that phrase okay. as well, mirror-filled room. <laughs> right, okay, good. So check I'm listening. Okay, here. Yeah. Um, some of us were present in the room the other day when Simon Calder was... We'd just been, been at another session trying to bring us from the Stone Age into uh, understanding tablets and apps. And uh, he said that he had observed that most people in the busy places in tourism in cities were walking around with guidebooks. 
Um, and that brings me to the point that in the foyer of hotels still is printed material. Uh, just as we heard that the internet would kill the book, but actually it hasn't yet. Uh, and all kinds of media are used in the tourism experience in the city. And the question is, how does that find a balance in the future? And just as people now like to, as it were, print a PDF about the place they're going to, because they can keep it in their pocket and it doesn't rely on a battery, how do we get this balance between the new online, the new apps, and traditional media? Okay, let me ask Helen, because I mean, Helen did give us a presentation which I thought showed how a, you know, a, a mature organisation, which is still very occasionally lovingly known as auntie, has managed to broadcast itself on a whole range of platforms with a sort of complementarity between them. I mean, that, that's addressing exactly this. TV yeah. wasn't killed by all of this new stuff, was it? No, and I think, I think we've consistently found time and time again that as new platforms and products have, learnt, have launched, that has expanded the portfolio rather than killing off the portfolio um, and transferring all of the usage. Because I think it comes back to that thing about the occasion, the type of user... Um, that is using it um, and you know um, be, be, because some users will plan in advance some users won't plan in advance some users will um, some users will carry their mobile and use data everywhere some users won't so it's about understanding um, it's about understanding exactly what sort of user you're trying to attract and then the right sort of media to get them in, in that particular situation from my perspective. Yeah, I mean, te we technology, like that, uh, I think it's, it's important to uh, remember that technology changes things, doesn't necessarily replace things. And that applies to everything from print media right through to the taxi industry. And I think the most important thing is to adapt to what your customers actually want and what is going to uh, improve their experience. So if you check into the Mal Maison and it's nice to have some kind of printed uh, overview of what the hotel offers, there is a use for that if that is going to improve the guest experience. Likewise, um, if you uh, read something in a magazine, you know, there may still be a place for reading something in a magazine, but then adapting that, so allowing for that online engagement, just in the way that television has very successfully uh, moved into a really strong multi-device world where people are watching, uh, maybe paying less attention, uh, concentrating less to what's on the television, but then researching and looking for further information or even talking about that uh, through things like Twitter. So I think it's not a matter of... Um, and I've worked with many digital marketeers who spend their whole careers trying to convince their uh, managers to just scrap whatever they're printing and move it all online. Um, it, it depends, it really does depend, so it depends on what's right for the customer. Although a hotel giving out iPhones in the foyer would probably be quite popular. <laughs> that's, quite, that's quite cool, yeah. <laughs> Here. Hans Dominicus. Um, an interesting ad addition from the practical field is what our recent research in Amsterdam showed is that visitors needed more information than ever before, actually. We see the number of people coming in our tourist offices physically, they need information more, where we have apps, where we have everything. And actually what you see in the uh, cyber chaos, they get so many information, they're looking for somebody who says, well, no, this is good. 20 years ago, they would go with uh, Europe on $5 a day, is this a good hotel? Now they come with the print and say, well, is this a good hotel? Nevertheless, this is an answer we haven't found yet. There is still a reason for us, uh, and this I say as a city tourist office, there is a reason for us to help the guest. And as described before, I mean, we have to be wherever the guest is and then look on the media, the, 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 the technic techniques we have, but still the human advice is essential to a certain extent, and that's interesting. They need more and more so resources for the same decision. Mm -hmm. So actually, we have to spend more and more and more to get them on track. Yeah. I think, I think users are used to more information. I think it's a really good point because users are used to more information in every part of their lives. You know, once upon a time, people would stand on the side of the road and wait until the next bus came. Now they need to know when, what time the next bus comes, how long it takes to get there, what are the other bus options of when they get there. Um, and that has really changed. 
Yeah, yeah I think there's, the there's, a, there's a lot of noise out there on the web. <laughs> and I think that's really, um, as much as it's great, it can also be very frustrating, especially as a visitor going to a new city and you perhaps don't have your go-to app or your website that immediately you go to. Perhaps it's TripAdvisor, perhaps it's the city's tourist board, you don't know. And I think personally, uh, I quite enjoy walking into a tourist information center or asking someone for advice because it's quick, it's fairly... This noise is quite painful. <laughs> I, I was about to say, it's fairly pain-free. <laughs> this is quite painful, though. Um, and uh, you, you often get the advice that you're looking for straight away. I think when you have an example like Intercontinental, there's a really good opportunity to merge the two worlds a little bit. So where you have this really strong brand uh, component, which is the concierge service, building that into a digital experience can perhaps give something along the lines of what you're describing um, in a digital environment. Right, question here and then there. Yeah, hi, uh, Patrick Richards. Um, tying the uh, talk into cities again, um, you've described the digital natives. Do you have any um, opinions or statistics on whether this new age of digital natives is more urban in its nature, either in its origin or its propensity to travel? Do they prefer to go to cities? Are they city in, 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 in where they live? Any thoughts on that? And can I tie into that? I, I wanted to ask, does this mean that places that are not hitched up to the internet are going to get left behind? Because this, this, if people really rely on all this stuff so much, then places that are not really, really well connected will question, lose out. I, I can't answer uh, off the top of my head about whether these digital natives are more likely to be urbanites. But what I can tell you is that the urban population is set to increase uh, dramatically over the next 50 years, which you probably know. So I think the, uh, that probably answers your question itself. And to... Yeah, to ask about digital, well, I think uh, what we're seeing is a, one interesting thing popping out of all of the technology, which is uh, what's referred to as not spots, which are places which are actually free of technology, uh, which people are actually seeking as a haven from technology because they have so much in their daily lives. So uh, there are different trends emerging, but I think for the vast majority of travelers, they are looking for an uh, inherently digital experience when they travel. Um, and urban environments provide uh, the, the most interesting exploration of those two worlds. I mean, we do know within the UK that the most digitally connected part of the United Kingdom is London, which is the biggest city. But on the other hand, I'm not sure if we know that if you aim off for differences in age and income, for example. So I, I suspect uh, more, it's an interesting question, more research as ever needed. Gentlemen here. Hi, uh, Ian Waring, Magnetic North. Um, just wanted to ask a question about something that I think is probably relevant to a lot of the tourism businesses here and something that uh, Helen uh, referenced, and that's around um, brand loyalty. Uh, so are, have you seen examples of where these digital technologies, and including mobile, has, um, you know, ha has, has done much to, uh, to increase brand loyalty? I think that certainly with the app, they most definitely increase brand loyalty. Um, I think that um, you know, once once a user has an app, then they will go to it several times. They that the ease of that experience will then make them feel better towards the whole brand. Um, what is difficult, I think, is that you need a certain amount of brand loyalty to get that position on the on. Um, their home screen in the first place. Now you can just do it from having a really good app. Now if you have a really good app, we've all seen apps break through that are from brands we've never heard of or that we wouldn't expect. So it, it's not that it can't be done. I think it's easier if you have um, quite a strong brand in the first place um, because people, people um, there is no limit really to the amount of apps that people have, but people tend to have a certain number. And for you to get in that portfolio, you need to be a brand that they feel favourable towards, which is why I think it's quite important that your website experience is very good, because if your website experience is not good, then when it says, would you like to download this app, you kind of go, no, not really, this is driving me mad. So um, 
I think that that's a really important point um, because I think sometimes websites perhaps get neglected a little bit, especially on the mobiles, um, compared to um, the app experience. Uh, I think, yeah, I think that's an interesting question. There's two things. There's app loyalty and then there's loyalty apps, and they're both quite interesting and they <laughs> sort of converge as well. Um, I think maybe to, to first just touch on what Helen just said, we often, for some reason, and I don't know why, uh, overlook mobile web. Um, but your own statistics point to the fact that this is the most important channel to think about first. Mobile apps provide a really, really great opportunity for engagement, as your time of use shows. I mean, it's, oh, it's the frequency of use. Really, really impressive figures there, if you get it right. Um, and certainly the BBC gets it right, I have to say, except for 6 a.m. Uh, breaking news notifications, uh, the, <laughs> the, of, the sound. which are not always relevant. So I have to say, apart from that, it's great. But it's the sound. It it's the sound, the sound which the gets sound me. Yeah. yeah, and I have noticed that Sky have recently copied that. So. Yeah. But um, in terms of app loyalty, it really comes down to whether your app provides your users with a genuine functional need. And if it doesn't, it's very unlikely that they are going to go back to that app again and again. Uh, the BBC app, people need their news every day, so they go back to it every day. It makes sense. For me as a frequent traveler, uh, the flight track app serves a really core fu function. I go back to it every single time I travel, so there's that loyalty. But if your app is more of a marketing gimmick, it's probably not going to have any kind of resonance with the users. It has to improve something about wh how they interact with your brand. Another thing which is coming out uh, and being used more and more is loyalty apps. And this is a great opportunity, um, which not many brands have really tapped into in a good way. But there are some great examples, very simple examples too. So uh, all of you know Starbucks. And if you haven't downloaded the Starbucks app, you should do that. Because it's a great, very simple lesson in how to get a mobile app right. It only does one thing. Well, it does two things. It allows you to pay with your phone. So it improves your experience as a customer, if that's what you want to do. And it also allows you to collect points for everything you buy. Very, very powerful and a very good engagement there. Um, it's important to consider that uh, a, getting, downloading an app for a customer is very much like committing to a, a relationship. It's not something you do without considering uh, all of your options first. And it's not something you're going to stick with if you're not happy. So you have to view apps like that and really think about what, how you're actually improving your customer's experience. OK, um, I can feel Tom. Around. We're going to have to finish here. Uh, tea beckons, or uh, coffee as it's called here. Anyway, um, <laughs> I'd just like to th thank Nick and Helen for a fascinating window into a fast changing, complex, multi platform, but nevertheless fascinating, really interesting world. Thank you both. Thanks very much.